Hello, everyone. This is your podcast for anxiety disorders. And I want you to think back on a time when you perhaps had some pretty good anxiety going on. You had, you were anxious about a test. You were anxious about performing a lab skill. You were anxious about some aspect in your life. Or maybe you were just plain worried and couldn't put your finger on it. Well, we're going to talk about anxiety in the sense of anxiety that is disruptive to a person's life and disabling. So, um, get the slide switched here. What is anxiety? Anxiety, by and large, is a sense of psychosocial distress. Anxiety is largely rooted in fear. It should be differentiated from stress, which is not a disorder. We all experience stress in our everyday lives. And that's what you have to keep in mind, is that stress is a normal part of everyday life and does not have good or bad connotations. Sometimes stress is just that motivator, if you will, that, that makes us kind of get off the couch and, and get moving and do something. The perception of stress is individually based. Some important distinctions. Anxiety is a feeling arising from a nonspecific cause. A lot of times when you feel anxious, you can't really put your finger on it. It's an uncomfortable feeling that occurs in response to being hurt or losing something valued. But it can be a feeling that arises from an ambiguous, unspecified cause that is disproportionate to the danger. Um, when we look at anxiety disorders, and we'll talk about many different anxiety disorders, you can see that the characteristics are generalized, persistent anxiety with multiple s physical symptoms, continuously for a month or more, characterized by emotions of intense terror and thoughts of impending doom. Um, anxiety disorders are described as exaggerated and disabling. And this type of anxiety presents a threat to, the, to basic needs of security and to self. How do we differentiate anxiety from fear? Fear is a feeling that arises from a concrete, real danger. To treat clients properly <coughs> excuse me, and understand clients with anxiety disorders, it is important to understand the difference between anxiety and fear. We will assess our patient for anxiety, and the physical symptoms are those symptoms of fight or flight. In other words, these are the symptoms mediated by the sympathetic nervous system or that adrenergic response. Heart rate and blood pressure increase. Blood flows to the muscles. Breathing rate increases. Perspiration increases. Saliva production decreases. Digestion decreases. The immune response decreases. Energy stored glycogen is released. You need energy to be able to run away from whatever it is you're running away from, maybe the Tyrannosaurus rex. Your vision is um, more acute because your pupils are bigger. And your hearing is much more acute as well. So those are just some physical symptoms that we see with anxiety. Um, when we look at cognitive symptoms, when you're very anxious, you have decreased concentration, you have di difficulty thinking logically, and when you are, the, those emotional symptoms, I guess, you might, if you're suffering from anxiety, you might feel irritable, you might have anger, maybe withdrawal, crying, nervous, or worried. So those are all some signs and symptoms when you're assessing for anxiety. The effects of anxiety. Anxiety can be mild, moderate, or severe, affecting cognitive, psychological, and physical function. Mild anxiety is seldom a problem. Um, it's usually in response to some everyday, day-to-day -day living. And what it, a mild anxiety will prepare you for action, sharpen your senses, increase motivation for productivity, Increase your perceptual field. The person is more aware of their surroundings. Learning is enhanced and the person is functioning at an optimal level. 
as you can see on the slide, it, it says mild anxiety results in improved functioning. A lot of times, many of us need kind of that mild anxiety to just light a fire under us and get us motivated. But as you can see, as anxiety increases, people become less and less able to function. Moderate anxiety dulls perception. The perceptual field is diminished. The person is less alert to events in the environment. Attention span and ability to concentrate are decreased, but with direction, the person can still attend to his or her needs. Assistance with problem solving may be required. The person experiences increased muscle tension and restlessness. After moderate, we have severe anxiety. The perceptual field is greatly diminished. The person finds it hard to concentrate, has a limited attention span, has trouble completing even the simplest of tasks. Physical symptoms are intense, headache, palpitations, insomnia, emotional symptoms, confusion, dread, horror, very uncomfortable. Panic is the most intense anxiety. The person is unable to focus even on one detail. Misperception is present and loss of contact with reality is often experienced. Person may experience hallucinations or delusions. The behavior may be wild and desperate or extreme withdrawal. Person displays ineffective functioning and communication. Feelings of terror, going crazy, losing control are common. Prolonged panic can lead to physical and emotional exhaustion and may be life-threatening. So let's talk a little bit about some anxiety disorders. What are they? Well, anxiety disorders are a group of conditions in which affected clients experience anxiety that they cannot dismiss. With these clients, coping mechanisms are ineffective and anxiety interferes with activities of daily living. When we need to intervene, and Mrs. F can't find her arrow, um, anxiety requiring intervention. Indicators of a need for intervention or treatment of anxiety including a, include anxiety with the following characteristics. Greater than expected intensity based on the context. Prevents fulfillment of professional, personal, or social roles. It can be accompanied by flashbacks, obsessions, or compulsions curtails daily or social activities and lasts longer than expected given the precipitating stress. To effectively plan and provide treatment to people who are anxious, nurses need to carefully understand whether the anxiety is a transient, normative response to stress or a long-term response to a real or perceived threat that is negatively influencing the person's ability to function in their daily activities. Clients in a state of panic may not be able to communicate. Verbal behavior of those with moderate anxiety is commonly marked by frequent changes of topic, repetitive questioning, joking, wordiness, and blocking. Unrelieved anxiety causes physical and emotional problems, and people may use various adaptive or maladaptive coping mechanisms to try to manage it. In your book, um, in the chapter, chapter 23 on anxiety disorders, there's a box um, 23.1 and it goes over some adaptive and maladaptive coping mechanisms for anxiety. It lists withdrawal, retreat from anxiety provoking experiences, acting out, discharge of anxiety through aggressive behavior, psychosomatization, which is a visceral or physiologic expression of anxiety, avoidance, management of anxiety-laden experiences through evasive behaviors, and problem solving, which is our adaptive coping mechanism, system systematic method for addressing difficult situations. How do clients deal with anxiety? Well, when they can't get rid of anxiety in a usual way, they may use mental mechanisms to lessen feelings, regardless of the cost. Um, those are our defense mechanisms. But you can see on the slide that coping mechanisms, coping mechanisms are a conscious attempt to control anxiety. 
If the coping methods are effective, it will contribute to the individual's sense of competence and self-esteem. If they are ineffective, then it will detract from the individual's sense of competence and self-esteem. Again, defense mechanisms are those unconscious attempts to manage anxiety. What are some of those defense mechanisms? Can you think of any that people that are anxious about something commonly use? I can think of some. Denial, rationalization, projection, displacement, reaction formation, just to name a few. So here's a question. Mary Smith exhibits symptoms of increased anxiety when the closet and bathroom doors in her room are closed. She asks the night nurse to leave her doors open. Which would be the most therapeutic response? <coughs> and I'll give you a minute to read those. If you chose D, you seem to be frightened, I will leave the doors open and stay with you a while. That is the correct response because what you're doing is first and foremost you're acknowledging her feeling. And again, acknowledge feelings when you see test questions. If there's a choice that asks you to acknowledge feelings, that's typically the right response here in mental health nursing. We're going to look at several of the anxiety, obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders, which are under DSM-5, um, they're grouped together. Generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, trichotillomania, anxiety disorder due to another medical condition, substance medication-induced anxiety disorder, stress disorders, um, PTSD is one example, there are others. And phobias, and we'll look at some different phobias. Agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder, which we formerly called social phobia, and specific phobia or phobias. What you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about anxiety disorders is all behaviors are done to decrease anxiety. So what causes anxiety disorders. Well, what I guess I want you to know first and foremost is that anxiety disorders are prevalent in the most common occurring psychiatric disorder in adults, and it affects approximately 40 million Americans 18 years or older in any given year, so pretty, pretty uh, many that it affects. Um, pediatric prevalence rates vary greatly, but approximately 20% of youth experience an anxiety disorder. It is likely that these anxiety disorders result from a combination of neurobiologic vulnerabilities, developmental stage, and psychosocial stress. When you're looking at neurobiologic vulnerabilities, they look at several things like the hereditary predisposition which contributes to the development of anxiety disorders, brain chemistry, and developmental factors. You look at psychosocial stress, and according to learning theorists, anxiety results from conditioning by which people develop an anxious response by linking a dangerous or fear-inducing event. For instance, they might have a dangerous or fear-inducing event like a house fire. Linked with a neutral event, for instance, watching someone light a match, and that will be enough to put a person into a full-fledged anxiety attack, which perpetuates a vicious anxiety cycle just simply because a person lit a match. Cognitive theorists see anxiety as a manifestation of distorted thinking, perceptions and attitudes which overestimate the danger. Cognitive theorists also believe that many people with anxiety have an exaggerated need for approval and view even minor mistakes as catastrophes. First disorder we'll talk about, generalized anxiety disorder. This is characterized by these um, symptoms which um, happen on more days than not for six months or more. 
excessive worry or anxiety about multiple issues which linger six months or more, interferes with daily life and re relationships. Some of the symptoms we see, motor tension, autonomic hyperactivity, apprehension expectation, apprehensive expectation, hypervigilance for potential threats, impatience, irritability, feeling on edge, feeling tense, feeling distracted. Panic disorders are characterized often by panic attacks. Unpredictable onset, they're intense. Person is very apprehensive, has a lot of fear, terror, and impending doom. It's the highest level of anxiety and characterized by disorganized thinking, feelings of terror, and helplessness. It's often associated with particular situations. Signs and symptoms of a panic attack are those physiologic reactions chest pain, choking or smothering sensations, dizziness, dyspnea, fainting, hot and cold flashes, palpitations, paresthesias where you get the numbness and tingling in your hands and feet, sweating and vertigo. Clients may also report feelings of depersonalization or derealization, fears of dying or going crazy or uncontrollable behaviors. In the case of depersonalization, the individual may feel detached from his or her entire being. He or she may also feel subjectively detached from the aspects of the self, including feelings. Um, they might say things like, my thoughts don't feel like my own. They might have kind of unusual sensations. There may also be a diminished sense of agency. They feel almost robotic like an automaton, lacking control of one's speech or movements. Episodes of derealization are characterized by a feeling of unreality or detachment from or unfamiliarity with the world, be it individuals, inanimate objects, or all surroundings. The individual may feel as if he or she were in a fog, dream, or bubble, or as if there were a veil or glass wall between the individual and the world around. Surroundings may be experienced as artificial, colorless, or lifeless. Derealization is commonly accompanied by subjective visual distor distortions such as blurriness, heightened acuity, widened or narrowed visual field, two-dimensionality or flatness, or altered distance or size of objects. So a lot of different signs there. How then do we reduce anxiety if we have a patient that's very, very anxious? First and foremost, we need to remain calm. We'll use a calm voice and simple sentences or directions. We'll treat the hyperventilation because oftentimes what happens in a very uh, panicked individual, they will, of course, their heart is, is beating fast. They will breathe fast in response to that. So, you know, if you've ever seen somebody treat somebody with a good old-fashioned um, paper bag where they breathe in and out of the paper bag, and you want them to do this if you're going to do this with a patient, have them take at least about six good breaths, you know. Breathe out and then breathe back in from the bag. Breathe out into the bag, breathe back in from the bag. And what you're doing is you're actually increasing CO2, thus slowing the respirations down. You want to be a good listener. You want to stay with the person during the attack. Decrease the stimulation. It's very, very important to bring down that stimulation. Low lighting, not a lot of noise, not a lot of people around. Encourage relaxation techniques. We're going to look at those on the next slide. Encourage the individual in diversional activities. And again, these are on the next slide. Help him or her to develop insight. In other words, help him or her to better understand and identify when he or she feels anxious. Ask if they've ever had this experience before. What were they doing at the time? We're kind of exploring for those possible reasons. And what did they do to feel better? To prevent future anxiety reactions, assist the person to explore future events that may provoke anxiety 
and then you use role play as a means to decrease anxiety. Teach the client signs and symptoms of escalating anxiety and techniques to manage it, especially relaxation techniques, diversional activities. Engage them in social support. So here's a slide for you, stress reduction methods, and it's just a good overall recap of some of the things that we've talked about. Types of stress disorders, acute stress disorder, acute PTSD, there's a chronic PTSD and delayed PS PTSD. Stress disorders are similar in that they result from exposure to a severe or extraordinary stressor. Acute stress disorder occurs after exposure to extreme trauma typically. It can be a combat situation, a rape situation, a physical assault, a near-death experience, perhaps witnessing a murder. Dissociation is oftentimes connected with this, and it's a state of detachment in which people experience the world as dreamlike and unreal as a primary symptom. It can be accompanied by disassociative amnesia, and typically that is characterized by poor memories of specific events surrounding the trauma. And it resolves typically within 2 to 28 days after the trauma. Okay, the main difference between um, acute stress disorder and PTSD is that the PTSD lasts a lot longer. And remember, it can be acute, it can be chronic, it can be delayed. It's a pattern of psychological symptoms brought on by the experience of a highly traumatic event. It was first identified in Vietnam vets, uh, soldiers, doctors, nurses alike. And it's now identified in numerous survivors of other traumatic situations. It's characterized by flashbacks. So the first thing that happens is the person will relive the nightmare. They'll have intrusive thoughts or obsessive rumination. And often flashbacks are a way of being in the event again and can be triggered by a seemingly neutral stimulus. They tend to insulate themselves from their emotions and feelings. This is like a psychic numbing. Remember that this trauma involves a wide range of feelings, fear, panic, guilt, anger, physical and emotional pain. After the event, the individual isolates him or herself to protect him or herself from further hurt. Um, it's often accompanied by anxiety and depression, and along with anxiety and depression often comes suicidal ideation, and substance abuse is common. It's used to handle conflict or difficulty sleeping. Um, they try to self-medicate to, to feel better. Impaired role in social functioning may occur as well as interference with occupational and recreational functioning. So just to kind of recap that list, isolation, re-experiences of trauma, sleep problems, hypervigilance, a rage that is unexplainable, depression, survivor guilt, memory impairment, and substance addictions. So how do we work with a client that has PTSD? We want to assist the client to gain an understanding that others validate the traumatic nature of the event. The client needs to gain control of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and we need to assess the symptoms. The client will strive to psychologically separate from the event and look more into the future. To reach these goals, assist the client to utilize support systems available assist the client to move from the negative label to the positive use of crisis, and desensitize the client from traumatic images. Now there are many uh, therapies, cognitive behavioral therapies that do work, but they found particularly with vets, there it's called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And if you're very interested in that, hearing about that technique, you can go into this link and it will be explained to you. It's pretty interesting stuff. It's kind of one of those that uh, 
was developed as really a quick quick therapy that could be used for soldiers that have experienced combat and so on. Next thing we'll talk about are phobias. And there are four features common in all phobic disorders. Unreasonable behavioral response, persistent fears, avoidance behavior, disabling behavior. With all phobic disorders, there's a fear of losing control. Do any of you have phobias? I'll share mine. I have a fear of heights. I've been hypnotized twice. Um, that, along with some pretty good desensitization, has really helped me to beat a lot of my acrophobia, if you will, but I still have moments. So the first um, phobia we'll talk about is agoraphobia. And this is a persistent fear of specific situations driving open spaces, closed spaces, public places. If panic is present, then it's panic disorder with agoraphobia. If no panic, then agoraphobia without panic. It's characterized by the same symptoms characterized by panic disorder when it is with the, with the uh, panic. In addition, I named some fear of specific situations, driving, open spaces, closed spaces, public places. In addition, the individual experiences a fear of being in places or situations from which escape might be difficult or embarrassing, or in which help might not be available in the event of a panic attack. Typically interferes with functioning and is less common in community settings. Social phobia is a fear of social situations. For example, public speaking, stage fright, using public restrooms, eating in public, being ab obser observed at work, being in crowds of people. All fears are based on losing control, which may result in being embarrassed or scorned. The intensity to which the individual is disabled depends on how easily the social situation can be avoided. You'll have to fix the typo in that. To intensity to which individual is disabled depends on how easily the social situation can be avoided. As far as specific phobias, these are a fear of only one object or situation, and it can occur after a single unpleasant experience. Patterns that develop as a defense against anxiety, fear, and of a, fear of an object, situation, or activity that is not realistically dangerous, but has come to represent danger, and specifically enough to transform anxiety into fear. It's a persistent, irrational fear of something that results in a compelling desire to avoid. Anxiety oftentimes is from, might be from a different source, but it's displaced to something concrete that can be identified and avoided. They feel that 20 to 45 percent of the population has some form of, of mild form of phobic behavior. 20s and 30s is a common age of onset. So what are some nursing interventions? Focus on the person, not the phobia. Support the client's efforts to avoid contact with the feared object or situation. Usually they can see the irrationality of the symptoms and how it has affected their life. And then there's some psychological techniques which are usually led by your psychologist or your psychiatrist on your team. Um, systematic desensitization. It's a gradual exposure to a phobic stimulus, and it was developed in 1958 by Joseph Vol Wolpe. It's based on behavioral conditioning, so in other words, this is used slowly to expose the patient to their fear. Let's say the patient is afraid of snakes. First, talk to them about snakes. Second step, maybe looking at pictures of snakes. Third, go to the zoo and look at actual snakes. And fourth, hold a snake. Reframing is another cognitive behavioral technique where we'll do some talking and try to get those person's distorted thoughts and fears turned around so they're looking at it in more of a positive way. Another disorder we'll talk about is obsessive compulsive disorders. These are severe enough to be 
time consuming or to cause marked distress or signs of impairment. Obsessions are those unwanted repetitive thoughts. Compulsions are behaviors or thoughts used to decrease fear or guilt associated with the obsession so that then they are linked. The obsessions invade the consciousness and are experienced by the individual as senseless. Attempts are made to ignore or suppress these thoughts. For example, thoughts of killing someone or the fear of being contaminated with germs, recurrent persistent thoughts or impulses or images. Compulsions the individual generally recognizes the senselessness of the behavior and derives no pleasure from carrying out the activity, but it does reduce tension like hoarding objects or hand washing. You might have cognitive compulsions or thoughts, maybe silently counting or repeatedly thinking a sequence of words. A person will feel driven to re- perform the repetitive, attack, uh, the repetitive acts. At some point during the course of the disorder, the patient recognizes obsessions are excessive or unreasonable. But what they do is, by carrying them out, it does reduce their anxiety, which is what keeps them going. A couple other disorders here. I put a couple pictures up for you. Body dysmorphic disorder, and this one is trichotillomania, or hair pulling. Question. Annie Fine, age 29, four months pregnant, is admitted to the psych unit because she has been carrying out rituals that interfere with her ADLs. She compulsively washes her hands, and they are dry, red, and peeling. Her husband complains that she is so busy washing her hands that she is neglecting him, the children, in the house. You are admitting, Mrs. Fine, you can predict that Mrs. Fine's anxiety level will decrease immediately. And I'll let you read those. And if you chose D, that is the correct response. Her, her anxiety will decrease when she does the compulsive behavior. So here's another question. Annie's washing rituals occupy many of her waking hours. Due to this, she often misses breakfast and is late for a morning therapy session. As a nurse, you would. And if you chose B, that is the correct response. So some desired outcomes of treatment of anxiety disorders. Well, treatments for symptoms fall into two categories, pharmacologic and cognitive behavioral. The individualized plans of care for clients may include one or both categories depending on the severity of the symptoms, client motivation and preference recommendations of healthcare professionals and cost. So what we aim to do is, of course, the desired outcomes of treatments. Treatment, we want fewer or no anxious symptoms, resumption or enhancement of productive professional, social, and family roles, replacement of maladaptive coping strategies with adaptive ones, and improved quality of life. Healthcare providers use various methods of CBT, or cognitive behavioral therapy, to treat different anxiety disorders. And they're kind of, you know, it depends on the anxiety disorder, but I'll give you a brief overview. Basic cognitive therapy, where the goal is to have the person gain insight into situations that provoke anxiety and then learn new responses to those situations. We use education, problem-solving strategies, but primarily we focus on helping that person learn to identify and change faulty thinking that can lead to emotional distress. Treatment may last 12 to 20 weeks. I already talked about systematic desensitization. Works really good with phobias. It's a classical conditioning method. And these clients learn to replace gradually a panic response with a relaxation response. Exposure treatment is similar to desensitization in that it involves exposure to the feared object or situation, but it does not involve relaxation or a gradual approach to the source of anxiety. It does allow clients to have some control over how long they're exposed to the fear-causing object, 
if desired, and is therefore known as either flooding or graduated exposure. Relaxation techniques. Relaxation methods are extremely helpful in managing anxiety and stress. The relaxation response, a term coined by mind-body medicine pioneer Herbert Benson, is a physical state of deep rest that counters the fight-or-flight response. It results in a feeling of peacefulness, decreased heart rate, blood pressure, and muscle tension. We can also use breathing retraining. By practicing controlled breathing techniques in the early stages of a panic attack, clients may be able to minimize the attack. So again, those are just some ideas about what we can use uh, for as far as a cognitive behavioral technique. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the meds. Anxiety disorders in the meds typically will use the anxiolytics, the antidepressants, and indications for use of these um, GAD, um, generalized anxiety disorder, acute anxiety disorder, social phobia, performance anxiety, simple phobias, and short-term relief of insomnias. Typically, we use the BZDs, which are benzodiazepines. The SSRIs, a little bit more about them later. Uh, Buspirone or Buspar, TCAs, beta blockers. Oftentimes, we'll use TCAs when it's a question of somebody having um, a lot of insomnia. Using TCAs as a bedtime dose will really help that insomnia. We can also use benzodiazepines or the BZDs in heavier doses than we use for anxiety to um, help that person go to sleep because it, it functions then as a sedative hypnotic. Um, anxiolytics, typically the benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines act to enhance GABA. And if you have studied GABA or know a little bit about it, this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that if you think in terms of the phrase slow down, settle down, this helps the person slow down and settle down when you enhance GABA. So again, the anxiolytics, particularly the benzodiazepines, will enhance GABA. Advantages of the benzodiazepines, rapid onset, high tolerability. Um, people tolerate these drugs pretty well. Disadvantages, risk of physical dependence, and higher, high potential for abuse. The most overprescribed and abused meds in the U.S. are the BZDs. Short-term use is best, and we often give a limited, or the provider gives a very limited prescription, so there's, they don't have too many to abuse. Um, what will happen oftentimes with these is we will, we will use the benzodiazepine for some short-term therapy in conjunction with maybe an SSRI, to, um, which will be much longer term, to try to treat this person. Um, guidelines for use of the BZDs, use the lowest dose necessary to obtain sy symptom relief. Watch for sedative effects and be aware of the risk for injury. Use for short periods only. Use cautiously in clients with a history of substance abuse. Use cautiously in clients whose family members have a history of substance abuse. Do not discontinue them abruptly because it can trigger severe withdrawal symptoms and intense rebound anxiety. And these meds, because they potentiate the effects of alcohol and other sedative hypnotics, should not be used with other CNS depressants. Looking at the BZDs, um, some common, common side effects. Sedation, ataxia, dizziness, impaired coordination, slurred speech, paradoxical agitation. Caution, don't drive or operate machinery. Cognitive disturbances occur and met and memory impairment. And these two side effects can delay a client's positive engagement and response to CBT. So they don't like to use a lot of them in the clinical setting. Um, bus busperone or buspar um, is a non-BZD. It does not produce tolerance. It is not addictive. 
It is non-sedating, although it can cause a little drowsiness. It requires one to two weeks before it produces anti-anxiety effects. Maximal effects may not be evident till about week six of therapy. It's commonly used for general anxiety disorder and common side effects, nausea, dizziness, headache, insomnia, agitation, dysphoria. And dysphoria is that kind of state of distress and unease, and it actually boosts perone can increase the risk of suicide. So oftentimes you can use BZDs common in early treatment and then gradually reduce in DC. And you can use this um, as an adjunct med or kind of replace the short-term BZD with Buspar. If the treatment is going to be long-term, antidepressants are often used instead, or, you know, as an adjunct until you get a person off the BZD. Beta blockers. Um, think about your O walls. These, um, the example here is propranolol, and that's a commonly used one because it affects the physical manifestations of anxiety. And how it does it is it blocks that adrenaline response or that fight and flight response. It calms the jitters the tremors, the sweating, the increased heart rate, the increased respiratory rate that go along with the adrenaline response. We often use it for stage fright or other public speaking events. Side effects, bradycardia and hypotension, depression and nightmares. Do not discontinue abruptly. So nursing assessment. Physiological, when you're looking at a patient with anxiety disorders, you can look at assessment tool 23.1, and it gives you some common findings associated with anxiety disorders. Physiologic, like palpitations, chest pain, tachycardia, hyperventilation or shortness of breath, that choking, smothering feeling, dizziness, headache, paresthesias, where you have that kind of tingling in your hands, shakiness or tremors, um, choking sensation, dry mouth, nausea, vomiting or diarrhea, muscle aches and tension, and restlessness. Behavioral, perhaps pacing or fidgeting, appearance of overvigilance, restlessness. Cognitive, the person might have a fear of dying, going crazy, or other unspecified fear. Diminished problem solving capability, preoccupation with worrisome thoughts, decreased ability to concentrate. Effective, um, irritable, worried, tense, fearful, feelings of helplessness or inadequacy, overly excited, wary, or anguished effect. Sometimes the person will be unable to do their ADLs, and so you have to assess and see where they're at. And safety is an important assessment. Let's look at some nursing interventions then. Provide safety decrease stimulation, promote acceptance, teach and encourage relaxation techniques, teach and encourage healthy coping, encourage diversional activities, teach about and encourage the use of social supports, and above all, stay calm. If you are not calm, that person's going to feed off your anxiety and you're going to worsen the situation. Some uh, NANDA diagnoses for anxiety, Anxiety related to perceived threat or loss. Ineffective coping related to inadequate individual resources. Ineffective breathing pattern related to hyperventilation related to severe anxiety. So these are just some things that, or some nursing diagnoses we can use for the anxious patient. There are more. And desired outcomes of treatment. Outcomes that indicate improvement include the client identifies and uses adaptive coping strategies that are congruent with personal values. The client demonstrates one or more relaxation techniques. The client reports decreased incidence or intensity of anxiety or panic attacks. The client uses deep breathing exercises to prevent and manage anxiety and panic attacks. The client uses problem solving techniques to help manage difficult situations. And that's the end of your podcast for anxiety disorders.